Hello once again, I'm Extra Life, and you are looking at a big old jumble of wires that constitutes the bulk of our sequencer project so far. And today I'd like to take the next step and turn this into a more permanent prototype using the piece de resistance of electronics prototyping, the printed circuit board. Today is an exciting day because we get to take our project to a next level of sophistication and development. But it's also a sad day because, unfortunately, in order to do that, we have to use the computer. Now, it would be possible to create a circuit board without ever touching a computer. You could do that using something like an etch resist pen and a blank copper board. But using that technique, you could only make exactly one circuit board, and if it didn't work, you'd have to start all over again from scratch. The computer has several advantages, including the fact that you can change it after you design it, and there are ways in which the computer helps us do that design process by having libraries of parts and letting us do electrical rule check. So while I'm sure that watching me use the computer isn't the most exciting content that'll ever be on this channel, the advantages of the process are too numerous to ignore. So I'm going to quit complaining about it, and let's get to designing a PCB. So, this is the schematic for our sequencer. Uh, we're looking at it in a program called KiCad, or maybe it's KiCad, I don't know. KiCad is nice because it's open source. I've tried a couple different of these programs. I don't particularly like any of them uh, much better, so this isn't a recommendation, but there is a brand new version of this out, so I thought I would try it out. And this schematic uh, shows all of the different pieces that are going to be in the circuit, but they're not necessarily where they're going to appear physically. So this isn't a drawing of the PCB, it's a kind of map of how these things are connected. Uh, and up here you can see this is our ATmega328, which is the brain, the microprocessor that we're using to control the sequencer. And it's the same chip that's on the Arduino board. But this isn't an Arduino itself. This is all of the parts of the Arduino that we're going to need individually separated. So we have over here a 16 megahertz crystal oscillator, which gives us our clock signal. We have some power filtering and the voltage regulator. Uh, and then we have all the connections to the other parts of the sequencer. Uh, I'm not going to go over this in detail, but I'll, I'll try and give you an idea of uh, what you've seen and, and how that's maybe changed a little bit. Down here is the first part that we designed together. This is the digital to analog converter and the output that uh, raises the level uh, so it matches the voltage of the synthesizer rather than the 5 volt signaling of the Arduino. And this is actually a slightly different chip. It's the 4822, which is a dual DAC using an internal voltage reference. This TL072 is the same op amp we were using before, but you can see we've split it into two sections. And this is actually one chip with two op amps in it. We have, of course, our IO jacks that we'll use to connect it to other pieces of the synthesizer, the power connector with some diode protection, and the ICSP header. We could just use our Arduino to program the microcontroller, but since you'd have to pop out the chip and then move it around, and eventually you'd break off one of the legs, ICSP is easier because it's in-circuit serial programming. Uh, up here we have the LED matrix that we worked on last time and the button matrix, um, and those are connected to our I.O. expander. And down here we have the display driver for our seven-segment display, which is right here. And I've switched this up a little bit. I'm now using some discrete transistors. Previously we just had the the different digit outputs connected back into this same I.O. expander chip, but I was worried that we might be sinking too much current through this device and that we might fry it if we tried to make the display any brighter. In addition to the switches, of course, we have the potentiometers on the front panel that'll let us control the pitch, the octave, the length or duration of a step, and the CV value, or the additional uh, control voltage that we had down here. And this is the rotary encoder, which is like a potentiometer, it's a dial, you'll have a knob on it, and you turn it around, uh, and it makes things go up or down, but instead of being an analog scale with a variable voltage, it basically just goes up one step or down one step, depending on which way you turn it. And then the last piece, which is new, is this flash memory chip. And in principle, there's nothing complicated about it. It's just these uh, same three serial lines and another chip select line, but flash memory tends to operate at lower voltages. Uh, so in this case, this is a 3.3 volt chip, so we have to do some fancy stuff around here to shift these 5 volt serial signals down to 3.3 volts. Once we're satisfied that our schematic is free of bugs and has all the components in it, the next step is to assign footprints to those components. So here's a list of all the components, and they, some of them have names, 
Some of them have types. These are capacitors, as you can tell by these microfarad values. So we'll pick a sort of small-ish radial capacitor. These 47 microfarad ones are for the power input filtering. So if we want to look at it, we press this button here, and that's about the size of it. And so we go through each of these components and assign them footprints. Some of them will be a little more complicated because they've got lots of pins. Uh, but I'm going to go ahead and do that, and I'll meet you when I'm done. Alright, a few minutes later we've got footprints selected for all the components on our board. So the first thing we do is we generate a netlist and we save it. You can see I've got a previous one that I did there. And then that's it. We're ready to go to our PCB editor. Uh, and that's called PCB new. Uh, and what we do is we import that netlist and you can see it's the same one, but we could browse and find a different one here. And then KiCad reads it in and bam, our parts are all over the place. So I'm gonna position these parts and then we'll talk about routing. Okay, so after about an hour, I've got a layout that I think I'm pretty happy with. I started by moving all of the front panel components, so the switches and the LEDs and the display and the knobs, into the places that I wanted them. Those are the things where the position actually matters to the user interface. They have to look nice. Everything else can kind of get fit in around those components. So now that the layout is roughed in and we're ready to start routing, what we can do is turn the rat's nest back on grab our routing tool and pick a component we want to draw on a route for. So here's a resistor. And once we select this pad, it shows us kind of in highlighted view the, the places we need to take that rat's nest. And there's our first component routed. So uh, you'll see the time lapse and we'll see how long it takes me to, to get something workable. <laughs> Okay, and a little while later, we have our completed PCB design. And you can see we've made some changes, kind of had to do some mid-course corrections, and we've moved the switches and LEDs from that 4x4 grid into something a little more like an 8x2 that uh, more closely resembles my original design. We have the main 
microcontroller here and these serial lines snake around to our other chips. The rule of thumb is to try and put as much on the front layer as you can, and then try and save the back layer for the ground plane. And you can see this kind of crosshatched area here on the back is our ground plane. If we turn on filled zones, you can see all of that is gonna be copper poor. So that saves us on etchant and it adds a lower resistance path for all of these connections from ground. And on the front side, we have a copper pore in the same area, but this is not connected to anything. So there's just these copper islands here. And it should just save us on etchant since we're etching this board at home. So with most of the design completed, I think it's time to try and etch this board. And the first step, of course, is to print these copper layers onto our toner transfer paper. So we go to File and Plot. And this lets us choose a format. Since we're printing, we'll use PDF. If we were sending this to a fabrication house, we'd use Gerber. We pick the layer that we want. In this case, we'll do the front copper. And we need to mirror it because we're doing a toner transfer. And here is the resulting PDF. So now all the hard work is done, it's time to have some fun, print these out, and etch a circuit board. Okay, I am back from the print shop, and we are ready to try and do a toner transfer from these papers to our printed circuit board. This is glossy printer paper. I also tried using some um, magazine paper. So we'll see how those work and we'll use whichever one works better. Here's a finished printed circuit board, etched, drilled, and cleaned up. And you can see that the back came out nice and smooth and coppery, and on the front side, had to do quite a bit of repair work with the soldering iron and some fine wire. What I realized in this process, along with a whole lot about how you do layout and PCB design in general, is that if you're etching a board at home using the toner transfer process, you should give yourself a fighting chance and make these traces, I don't know, twice or three times as wide as the defaults in KiCad. The other option, of course, would be to use a PCB fabrication service, and there are a whole lot of them these days. You'll probably find advertisements for them down in the related videos if you look closely. And that's actually a really good option. The price has gotten a lot lower, it's very easy to use, you just upload your Gerber files to a website and they'll send you back some boards in a couple of days. But for this project, it was just important to me that this prototype comes from my own handiwork and is a culmination of lots of different skills that I've learned. And having made plenty of these mistakes along the way, I think I've learned a little bit more about PCB design than I would have if I had just gone directly to a fabrication service. Now that this board is more or less complete, it's time to start stuffing it full of components, soldering them in place, and then powering up to see if they work. But we'll get started on that in the next episode, so thank you very much for watching, stay tuned, and I'll see you next time.